Welcome, Nicole. Really glad you could make it on the Ideas Lab podcast. How are you doing? Very well, John, in these very interesting times. Yes, indeed, they are. And I'm so glad we could get you on at short notice. Of course, we know each other because uh, you're on my programs called Escape Velocity to help um, raise your profile because you have all this amazing expertise that is very relevant right now, which is about smart working, as you call it. And can you first of all explain what you mean by smart working? Well, we've seen flexible working being around for quite a while, you know, and some companies have embraced that really well and some haven't. So that's sort of been on a very sort of slow and steady journey. And then in some some organisations, they've started looking at it in the in the sort of bigger realm, really, as calling it smart working because they're taking into account um, furniture and offices and co-working spaces and all these sort of things. So that's sort of how this um journey for organisations has been going. But what we've seen, obviously, with the situation we're in now is that's sped up um, really quickly and sort of un- in an unprecedented way. And people are now being asked to go and work from their homes um, and they're not maybe ready for it. You know, and companies haven't had the strategy and all the discussions that they might have had. So it's how, how to sort of support them, really. And you recently gave a keynote speak at a big conference that was all about smart working, remote working and so on. And... Yeah. And as you say, there is a massive potential that what, you know, people had a lot of interest in this before uh, the, the coronavirus pandemic, because there's enormous potential for saving money primarily for companies, because if you don't have to have a desk for everybody, you save an enormous amount of money. I mean, is that the primary driver or is there more than that if we, before we get into our current situation? Yeah, there is more than that. I mean, that is definitely a big driver. Saving money is important for most organisations and whether it's public sector or private sector. But I think that some of the other drivers are for retaining and attracting um, good staff, really. I mean, the world is changing and other uh, people can see other organisations doing this quite well. You've got um, sort of younger generations uh, coming through the workforce and they're maybe they're much more sort of digital savvy and things like that. And they're, they're not really expecting to be nine till five sitting at a desk um, day after day. So it's just the world is changing really and, and companies are catching up. That's a really good point. I met people in Thailand and Bali and they work for big corporations, but they work remotely and they wouldn't be there. And they're very, really bright people. They wouldn't be there if they didn't have that flexibility. For me, there's no way I would ever go back and work in a company nine to five, five days a week. I'd, I'd rather do just about anything than do that. So um, for, for some people, that's that's really critical. But when people start to, you know, now everyone's suddenly being forced into the situation where they've got to send their staff home. And I'm seeing all, all my friends who are solicitors and stuff like that and all, a whole variety of, of, of jobs uh, being sent to work home. That brings up a whole bunch of issues, doesn't it? Because... There's been a resistance in companies to allowing remote working and flexible working. And that's one of the things you consult on. Um, I guess what, what's held people back until now? Are they worried that people are just going to skive off if they go home? Yeah, I think there's there's been a few things. First of all, some of it's been health and safety. It's always been like, you know, have their employees got you know proper desks set up and you know those sort of ergonomic workstations and things like that um set off set up at home which i, I always think that's not that shouldn't really be an issue because people can people can set themselves up in their own way and also you can move around a bit more if you're at home and things as well but the other thing is um is about productivity you know a lot some organizations have got that sort of culture where they're worried about productivity and they don't really maybe trust their employees to deliver the things that they should be doing or even just individual managers uh, have got that. So you might see an organisation that is quite open to this sort of flexibility of work and this, this sort of smart working way of life, but maybe sort of different managers maybe don't feel that their teams are working unless their teams have got their, all their bums sitting on the seats. So it's it's very sort of um, different and fluid. But what we have seen now is that these sort of managers haven't got a choice now. So their staff are going to be scattered to the, the four winds for the foreseeable future. So it's quite it'll be quite interesting to see how how that pans out and and also there's there's ways that we can help those managers um get over that fear really they've got fear of whether their team are going to deliver the things that they need to do so is that not true is that fear unjustified and and what should they do in order to make sure that they they can feel comfortable uh about sending their staff home 
think there's some things. First of all, they've got to, they've got to relax, basically. I mean, in in a way, this is like been enforced on them. So they so they so all the rules are off are out really. So they can um, they can look at it from a from a, from a blank piece of paper really and start again building those rules up. So some of the things are having clear deliverables for the team and for the individuals in the team. You know, it's not a question of just them just sitting sitting there for seven hours and they've done their work. We know that. Offices aren't very productive places anyway. They're only 60% productivity because people have chat and get distractions and go and make a coffee and have a wander about. You know, so all these things happen in the workplace anyway. So that's going to happen uh, at home. But what we have seen is that people are more productive at home because they sort of have that urge and they want to deliver because they've not got those distractions as well. They might have different distractions, but we can come on to that. But what, so what, so, so they're actually. So you're seeing that productivity goes up quite often. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. But product productivity. What is productivity? So that's a big issue. You know, in the old days, in industrial revolution, people were producing widgets and things. You could see what the productivity was. But, but for a long time now, those those sort of tangibles of productivity don't really exist. So it's up to managers and to teams to decide what is productive. And it's like having deliverables and having um, milestones that people can check in. And so, so some of the things that managers can do is have set up proper communication. That's really key. So whether you use some of these digital tools that are available, um, you know, channels and um, whether it's Slack or Sana or Trello or all these digital channels that that are sort of um, quite easy and intuitive to use or the organisations themselves might have these sort of things set up. But managers can use them to um, open up these channels of communication with their teams and get people to check in. So it might be that you have a daily sort of, um, it's called a stand up or a huddle where people get together and just sort of say the things that they're going to do that day. And then the next day they they tell people how they got on the day before, what things they're going to do the day that they're in there and what, you know, and whether they've had any blockers or problems. So it's opening up all those um, channels of communication and, and getting people to just, um, sort of work out loud. I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole um, topic about that in itself, you know. But it's getting people to be open and share what they're doing, which will be hard for some people. But that does get over the the fear thing, enables trust amongst the whole team and certainly with the managers, and lifts that productivity. Yeah, and so I mean, you were saying when we were chatting earlier that trusting your employees tends to pay off in terms of productivity. Is that right? Yeah. So some of the things that might happen, certainly, I mean, I myself, my my um, kids are going to finish today at lunchtime, you know, like like children all over the country and parents will be really worried. They're supposed they're working at home. They're probably their partner might be working at home as well. If they're all office based staff, they're going to have the kids in the house as well. You know, how are they going to juggle all that? So a lot of that is having those open conversations with the managers and for the managers being understanding and having that trust. Now, it might mean that parents have to work more in the evening rather than in the daytime certainly if they've got little kids you know that's going to be a big issue so it's like it's like managers have to relax and just look at whether just look at getting the tasks done rather than how and when they're done and that's going to be that, that's a big thing about flexible work and smart work and anyway it's about outcomes rather than you know inputs and outputs so and that's really interesting and I, I remember when I was invited to move to Montreal and work for a software company up there that had just been sold by Microsoft to the company I work for. And uh, the, the deal was it was 24 hour access. You could go into the building is an incredibly cool building and um, you go in at any time and there was no clocking in and clocking out and people, some developers just worked in the middle of the night and that's all. And, you know, now probably a lot more of them will work at home. And if you're motivated, you'll do it. So, it's, and it sounds a little bit from what you're saying that if you sort of suspect everyone's going to just mess around and cheat you, it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because you set up an environment and a, a tone where everyone just, it all feels very um, piecemeal or something. I don't know quite how to describe it. Yeah, or you might get that sort of adversarial thing, you know, you're trying, you know, trying to get away with it because you're not being trusted. So therefore, you're not going to deliver that trust, you know. I mean, I think that what's important is that not everybody can work like in the night. You can't just say to people, well, you can work in the night. It's fine for some situations but not others so it might be that you have to have some rules and this is what teams I think should do and managers should lead that is set up the, what are the rules for the teams you know because you want to um, mitigate any 
bad feeling or issues amongst the team members themselves, you know, or, or that person wasn't online for half an hour because I saw that their Skype presence wasn't wasn't like, you know, all these sort of things, you know, so they must have been not working, you know, but so you need to have a, maybe a team chart. My, one of my um, uh, clients, she, she set up a team chart in her organisation, which is quite good. So they can, you know, they decide as a team what the rules are. If someone wants to go and put the washing out, or it's got to go and deal with a small child, you know, then that's fine, you know, but they need to decide that as a team, what the rules are. And then that gives everybody that sort of confidence and um, and just helps with the general well-being as well. You know, this is, this is the way that we're going to work. I think that's nice. And, and I think what I'm noticing that the people who, and the tone I'm trying to adopt as well, the people who are winning right now and sort of, you know, if anything, raising their profile and, and um, make, and, becoming more important to people are the people who are being generous, making an authentic connection, um, just giving themselves, um, you know, in, in my case, it's often uh, entrepreneurs and experts giving their time for free. In this case, it's almost like employers saying, look, I, I just trust you and what can we do to help you? And that kind of coming from that kind of place seems to be because everyone's scared at the moment. And I think the other thing is, um, are the you know is it is it a company's role to perhaps address that and to manage people's mental health because I know everyone's going ups and downs. You know, the, some people are kind of freaking out today, and then I know as my mood goes up and down. For instance, so I was really worried yesterday morning, and then there was the news about treatments, and suddenly I, my lift my mood completely lifted. And today it's good, but who knows tomorrow? And every, but unfortunately, everyone's not in sync either. So. I'm seeing it with my friends and um, uh, it must be happening with employees as well. It is definitely, it's about, it's about um, relaxing those rules and being kind basically. And just understanding because, you know, everybody's got a low level of anxiety and then that just like you say, peaks and troughs depending on what's going on in the day. But businesses will be doing that as well on like an organizational level, you know, depending on how, on, on how they're cited. So if you can just take away some of that from the employees and lift it, sort of lift the whole organization and, and just work out what actually needs to be achieved and, and work out the best and easiest way to everybody to, to achieve that. I like that you mentioned briefly earlier on the idea of a daily stand-up. For people who don't know this, and perhaps I should be doing this, actually, because now I'm working with Ben and we've also just taken someone on uh, remotely. Um, How does a daily stand-up work? It might be you pick a time that's suitable for people. So, um, you know, it might be 10 o'clock. You might decide an afternoon one. And then you decide how you're going to do that. So whether that's a conference call, whether that's a video call. I mean, that's one of the things uh, about videos. There's lots of people that maybe a bit nervous about using video because they've not done that before. You know, we're on a video call just now and it's quite alien for people. They may might find a bit be a bit self conscious or something like that. But but I mean a video call for stand up is really is really good because you check in with everybody, you see your colleagues, you know, you can make it a bit funny. You can have, you know, five minutes at the at the beginning where you're just chatting about what's going on. You might have that thing where, you know, don't worry if the cat starts walking on the keyboard or the kids are running past in the background, you know. You just have to be open with this. This is the reality that we're in just now. But have that call and try and, you know, it's all Video is best, you know, if, if you can do it. And if the bandwidths are standing up to it, which they seem to be doing just now. But have that have that um, stand up. So it might just be 15 minutes where you just all sort of say what you're doing that day, what your, um, what your focus is for that day, whether you've had any blockers on the work that you were trying to get on yesterday. And just have that sort of chat about where you are in your work and how just how, you know, maybe top and tail it with how you're feeling and what else is going on. It's the same as that chat that you would have had in the desk, at the desk, you know, but just, just virtually, but with probably a bit more of a work focus than you might have had when you were in the office, because it's, it's just um, being more open about what work you're, you're doing so that everybody knows uh, where things are, where tasks are, and those that they're getting completed. So you might have that, as I said, like 10 o'clock every morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon or or whatever suits the team. I think that's a really good idea. And, of course, it's called a stand-up because when you're in person, the, yeah. traditionally uh, this came from Agile methods, didn't it, yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, stuff yeah. like that, uh, project management uh, approach. And um, they would literally stand up. And I know a lot of buildings now, a lot of corporate spaces with shared desk space, 
they have stand up meeting areas and everyone just gets around a table. And the point of standing up is that you don't want to stay there too long. Yeah, as soon as right, people exactly. sit down, they start kind of, you know, going into relaxation mode. Yeah, and it just lasts longer, doesn't it? So the idea is it's a quick, you know, quick, sharp meeting, just get the points over and then everyone goes on their way, which is really good. And I mean, that's probably one of the benefits that's going to come out of this is less meetings in general, really, and more focused meetings. And it might be that you don't have, um, you know, so many big group meetings apart from maybe that huddle, but you might have more one-to-one meetings. And that's something that managers should be um, helping their staff with is that, you know, don't feel if you want to... Um, Skype someone to just ask them a bit a quick question or in the afternoon just have a quick video chat with one of your colleagues then do that you know that that's perfectly um useful and advisable to do just have that connection have a chat talk about your piece of work end the call and go on you don't have to wait until the day you stand up to have you know discussions with your colleagues you can just be doing that on and off throughout the day yeah and often you know if you've been used to emailing people and don't email things that are super, super complex that you can resolve in a two minute call or, or a five minute video call. Yeah. And yeah. You, we, you talked about call um, tools earlier. And I think you mentioned Slack and Asana and um, something else. Just want to give us a sentence or two about what those are for anyone who doesn't know. But they're all sort of real time communication tools. So, so they're sort of like, they have things like instant messaging built in, the same as sort of Skype and Microsoft Teams. Lots of organizations are rolling out Microsoft Teams as part of their Office 365 um, sort of rollout. Certainly big corporations are. And they're all sort of similar things. Slack and Asana and Trello, they've all got um, sort of free versions, really, and then paid for versions. And they all do similar things. So it's really they've all got pros and cons, but they're all um, quite nice tools to work with. So you might have a project space or you might have sort of instant chat as well. So it takes some of the pressure off of email and everybody can see the whole chat. So if you do end up having a day off or, you know, you, you can come back in and pick up and see where the team where the team is with the with the project chat, for example, if they're talking about a particular project. So they're quite they can be quite useful. They need um, and maybe you know if you just if you've just um, sent all your team out to to work from home, you may maybe wait for the dust to settle a little bit, and then maybe introduce that in a little in a couple of weeks or something. You know, if you've not got something that your organisation has. Um, already supplied but the only thing is you have to be careful about what you share on these things like you do with everything because you have to have a look at um compliance for data protection and things like that as well to make sure that any tool that you choose is secure depending on what you're sharing and and uh, i think these these are a great way of creating communities we use slack between me and ben my assistant and um it it what i like it slack is like an instant messaging tool it's pretty much like you know, Facebook Messenger or whatever, but it's it's just designed as a corporate tool. And um, Asana and Trello have more project management stuff in it where you can put tasks and so on, but there's also chat around it. Um, and the nice thing, uh, what I find difficult about, Slack, uh, about emails, or if I'm trying to communicate something complex, I feel in an email I have to put everything in it and then hit send because there's no elegant way of just adding to an email. You hit reply and then it all becomes a big mess. And um, and so I like Slack because I, if I suddenly remember something, I can tell Ben, oh, don't forget, we're going to do, we need, we're going to need a podcast next week with with whoever it is. And and I don't have to follow, put all the information in immediately. He can then come back and go, okay, just give me the email or whatever. And I do that. And then so it feels like everything's, um, moving along and not waiting for the email feels too um, uh, sometimes like Indeed, isn't it really? not granular enough. And, yeah, and yeah. if you do have a fast exchange, if you've ever worked on something like a developer or something, you're going through multiple iterations, email quickly becomes an absolute nightmare because you get left with this trail of 25 emails in your inbox, read this, read this, read this. And then you've got to work out which ones you we're, you're still supposed to be reading and which ones you've already dealt with. So Slack has an advantage um, uh, over that. But it, I guess it even needs I, – I like that tip of don't immediately send everyone home and tell them to install Slack for the first time because they've got to adjust to being at home and all the stuff around that. You know, Skype or Zoom might be a big enough jump for them. Um, but to then say – because what you'll end up with is some of them will be on Slack and then some won't have installed it yet. And now – half the people are missing the conversation, I guess. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that is. And so you want to be inclusive and in that as well. So if you end up having a Skype conversation and helping someone and set something up, then, then that's quite useful as well because you want to keep everybody included. But, um, but you're right, um, you know, Slack and things like that are much more conversational, really, and much more intuitive in how humans really interact. The other thing that you can do with these tools is you, is you could have one that's set up for uh, just general chat, you know. So I've seen quite a few set up just in the last few days. And, and you know, if you're working at home, you're usually quite, uh, you know, things are quite quiet and you just work away. And I have to turn the notifications off because there was so much stuff coming on all the time in these different channels because people are just chatting about working from home and what it's like. And, you know, just and so you can have that as well. You know, there's, there's so much socialising going on as well online now. It's quite nice, you know. Yeah, and and it's important to continue that sort of water cooler chat. So we have there in Slack, for instance, there are uh, topics of conversation and all the different projects going on uh, in the Ideas Lab has a different channel. But there's also one called Random where Ben and I send each other sort of memes and funny articles and, and stuff yeah. like that. And um, and I, I remember seeing somebody who ran a company that did um, moderation of online communities with real humans and she had to have, uh, she had probably hundreds of women working for her, at least dozens all around the world. And they all work from home. And in order that they could feel, they're all women for some reason, it just panned out that way. And she, uh, she was a female entrepreneur. And um, and it suited them working around kids, I guess, uh, the ones who were mums. And, and what they did was they had a channel that was basically just for cat photos because they were so keen on cat photos I mean, for me, it would be dog pictures, but I'd be very happy to join any dog Slack channel that was going, even though I'm don't, not a dog owner. I just think <laughs> dogs are cute. All the emails start coming in. Now. Yeah, yeah, I know. Join our Slack channel. <laughs> so, you know, you can add that stuff in. And she, I think she did a brilliant job in creating something that felt like a real community, despite the fact that these people actually never met each other. I think that's great. It is great, and it, it, it opens up, you know, different. They're just different ways of working, and they and they can be really good. They're just as valid as, you know, working in offices uh, were. I think you know, they just things just changed. I think things will be changed forever more after this as well. You know. So uh, should we just give a couple of tips before we finish for people who are working from home? Yeah. At, on how to manage things like you know, setting yourself up and, and managing children being around you and stuff like that? Yeah. So, so say so first of all, if you, you know, you're starting, you know, might be starting uh, working at home this week or next week, you know, try and find yourself a workspace. It might not be ideal, you know, it might just be a tiny bit of space, but try and find something that you can designate as your workspace. Even if it means that you've just got a box where you put all your work things in and you take them out in the day and put them away uh, when you've finished work, you know, just, just try and eke yourself out um, a bit of space that you can work and make yourself as comfortable as you can. If you're going to have kids at home, I would say, you know, it depends on the age of your kids. If they're really tiny, all you can do is like work when they're napping, if they do that. Or if you've got a partner as well, maybe do tag teams and one of you works in the morning and one works in the afternoon, then you catch up in the evening. It'll be hard, you know, but you can only do what you can do. You know, um, if you've got bigger kids, you know, some kids might sit down for a couple of hours and watch a film. You know, um, if they're bigger still, I'm sure they'll game for as long as you can let them. Uh, but some of the things you can do is... Um, Maybe have a red, like a traffic light system. So you've got something on the door that's like red when you're really busy, like in conference call or something. Um, amber when they can maybe come in and speak to you if it's really important. And then green when you're OK and you're open to chat. And remember that when you're in the office, you would have had those sort of water cooling moments or when you go and chat with people. You know, you can still do that. It'd just be with your kids. And that's a really nice thing. And it's like a for, for a lot of people, that'll be a perk of working from home, I think. Yeah, it is. You know, it's just in a way we should see it as, a, you know, it's some aspects that will be really good, I think. Um, communication. So keeping that communication up. Now, that's with your with your work colleagues. And, you know, we, we've already spoken about that, but it's also with your family. So uh, I spoke about how you're going to deal with that with your children, but maybe also with your partner as well. You know, work out when you're working, when you're not working and, and just sort of get some ground rules together at this sort of early stage that's going to sort of carry you through, you know. Um, have that community. Now, whether that's with your um, work colleagues, 
in whether it's setting up setting up channels or having daily stand-ups or however you do that but also you've got the community around you so make sure that you get out and go for a walk and have regular breaks and things when you're working from home you might see a neighbor you might not be able to hug them in the same way as you used to but you know you can still sort of wave at people and see people go out and go and get some fresh air and have a bit of a break um so your tech out, so this sort of links to your workstation as well. Now, a lot of people I know when, when there's, there's Skype calling the things, they, they don't have headphones, you know, so try and find some headphones. So you might not have the most expensive noise cancelling headphones that money can buy, but just try and get something. So even if it is the, the headphones that you use for your uh, mobile phone, if it's got a microphone or the better, because there's nothing worse than trying to listen to a Skype call or people trying to listen to you while you've got all the noise going on in the background. So try and get some sort of um you know, technical help. If your company can help you provide help by providing something with that, well, then ask them because um because that's quite important, I think, and that makes you more confident because then you can hear the things that are happening in any calls and um um video conferences that you're having, you know. And then there's, there's a, just to, uh, two more points. So one is maybe decide how you work. So you might. You know, you might not really be a nine to five person. You might work better in the morning, better in the evening. So so work your working day around how you work and obviously have those open discussions with your manager. And we've already uh, spoken about that. But, you know, when are you most pro, pro, uh, productive in work? As I said before, all the rules are off. So you can recreate your working day. And just as long as the tasks are done and you deliver the things that are required, then that should be fine. And then the last thing is look after yourself, you know said about having breaks make sure you eat something make sure you don't work too long hours because you can do that i know that a lot of people that work from home they might they might log on early i don't know if you do this john but you log on sort of at eight you might log off at 10 at night, but you don't work all those hours you come you do a bit you go away come back you know so you do that so you know work um work out or decide how you work and then fit everything around that yeah no that's a really good tip yeah that, that's really useful, Nicole. So um, th- lots of good information there for people who are running companies, sending their teams home, but also for people working at home. And, um, and and I think, you know, it's going to be an adjustment period. So be forgiving of yourself and of your staff. Uh, it's kind of note to self as well. Uh, well, I mean, I'm not really adjusting that much because I work at home mostly anyway, but, but everything's so up in the air, but there's still a sort of, adjustment period of, of just getting your head around that where the world is right now but, i mean your your situation would change as well because you can't you can't go and work in your local coffee shop in the same way that you would have done or just go for wander down the street and do the same things you would have done or go to the gym and things you know things change for everybody really so it's just you know cutting yourself some slack really and relaxing into it yes yeah that's a, be kind you said earlier and i think that's a really good tip so um that's really good, and um, and we're working for the for you know we're halfway through a year long program together, my Escape Velocity program to help you um, get your message out there. So um, this has been a good a good uh, experiment, I think, but shows that you really know what you're talking about, Nicole, which I always suspected. Good, 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 good. <laughs> um, and uh, there's a reason why she's known as uh, well. I I call her the UK's you know remote working expert i know you, you you're a little bit shy about calling yourself such things but don't worry don't disagree with me i know what i'm talking about and um uh you can find out more about nicole uh, linkedin is probably still the best place to go isn't it yeah it is yeah so being. where do we find you on linkedin uh so i'm nicole hyphen carter uk okay so if we go to linkedin you or if you yeah. just search for nicole carter then we'll be yeah. able to find you. And I think also I've twisted your arm to start doing some LinkedIn lives fairly soon where you can do some more in-depth Q&A. People will be able to turn up and go, you know, what do I do with my my staff or how am I going to cope with working from home from whichever side? You're up for that, aren't you? Yeah, so I certainly am. And if anybody wants to post and, or connect to me on uh, LinkedIn and send me any questions, then then I'll be happy to answer them and come back to people, either LinkedIn Live or directly. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. So just connect with Nicole Carter on LinkedIn and start doing that. So thanks very much, Nicole. I really appreciate that. It's been, it's been great. Thanks very much.